Greetings again, young scholars, to chapter two, entitled Company and Marketing Strategy, Partnering to Build Customer Engagement Value in Relationships. There's value again. Uh, that's a recurring theme throughout uh, marketing, uh, especially principles of marketing, but marketing in general. Uh, I have placed uh, number one rescue dog in Georgia on the title slide today because that's a funny picture. What does it have to do with chapter two? Uh, nothing. Absolutely nothing. So with that said, see you Leo. Uh, we got to move on. So this first slide or actually the second slide is just definitionally what strategic planning is. So strategic planning sets the stage for the rest of the planning, right? Uh, process, the process of developing and maintaining a strategic fit between what we want to do, what we're able to do, and what's happening in the market, right? Because one thing that's constant, the market is always changing. I'm going to take this opportunity to make you aware of a pet peeve of mine is when people uh, misuse the word strategy. Now you say uh, you'll be at a party, let's say, and somebody goes, yeah, I got a strategy on that. What I do is uh, I take one tire off at a time or whatever they say. Well, that's not really a strategy. That's a tactic. And here's the key. Strategic plans or anything strategic is typically, let's just say, rule of thumb, at least a year long. A tactic is shorter than that. And a strategy can involve multiple tactics. So let's say that the strategy is for Kroger to maintain their dominance in the grocery business in Georgia as measured by total sales. That's what the bosses lay down. And then below them, some other managers will say, okay, how are we going to get that done? Well, we need to open some stores. Uh, where do we need to open them? What kind of stores? Uh, blah, blah, blah. And those are all tactics that they take to get to the strategic goal, which is to dominate the grocery business in Georgia. Okay. So if it, there's a difference between strategies and tactics and people misuse them all the time, television or radio and in conversation, but you're not going to because you're smarter than that. So this chart, uh, kind of uh, outlines the steps. You'll see it starts at the very beginning at the corporate level. Uh, you define the overall purpose and mission. And, you know, there comes mission statements again. Uh, and then you see it create a detailed plan or detail supporting the objectives, what we're going to do. And then the third cube, they'll decide what portfolio of businesses and product is best for the company, meaning what can they do? What can they make? What can they get? And then how much support we're going to give to each one. Which one do we think is going to make the most money? If we give our, give X amount of support to this line, Y amount of support to this line, the carpet business is big in Dalton. So I might say, how much are we going to uh, spend supporting carpet versus, uh, you know, resilient flooring. Our Apple says, how much I spend to support uh, Apple TV versus uh, desktop IMAX, right? So uh, that just kind of lays it out picture wise. And you see the business unit product and market level is over here on the end. And they plan the marketing and strategies and other things the way they're going to get that done, right? So the marketing planning wouldn't come until the big bosses kind of line out what we want to do strategically. 
and then it'll be left up to the marketeers to figure out how to make that happen. So mission statements. This is an example from IBM. It's kind of short, you'll see. Customer focused mission. Let's build a smarter planet. Okay. Do you have any idea what the right school of business mission statement is? Well, I assure you it's much longer than that. It's the first page on your syllabus. So it starts with the CMR and Ann Wright School of Business, Dalton State College, offers undergraduate business programs to serve a diverse student population and goes from there to address visions, excuse me, not visions, vision, values, and then outcomes and goals. It's a whole page. Uh, it's the front page, should be the front page on every syllabus you have. Is it too long to remember? Absolutely. Do you think IBM employees could remember that one? Yeah, they're using that for marketing and a position statement. Let's build a smarter planet. Uh, yeah. So probably somewhere in the middle is the best way to do that. But you can look up on anyone's corporate website and see what their mission is. Everybody's going to have one. Just so everybody knows what our purpose is. So we have business objectives on the left side, marketing objectives on the right side of this, of this slide. So, you know, they're different is the point that I want to make here. For example, the corporate office might say, we need to improve profit. That's a business goal for the firm. Okay. So the marketing objectives would be, well, if we increase our market share, I'm going back to groceries again, of grocery customers in Georgia, we could improve profits. Or if our highest margin item in the uh, grocery store in a Kroger, let's say it's a uh, fresh cut meat. If we could increase our market share in Georgia of fresh cut meat, then that would improve profits. So you'll see they just have a loose objectives over here, which generally bosses do. They just go, hey, improve profits. Then we have to say, okay, how are we going to do that? Maybe if we advertise more and maybe if we concentrated on cut meat, then these two items would result in this business objective they've lined out. So the point is that they're different and uh, they feed in one other. And you don't typically get objectives from the corporate office that are really, really detailed. That comes up uh, later when somebody else decides, somebody below that, that level of the top C-suite guys or ladies put that together. So this is an example of Heinz, which by the way is the, uh, you know, the only ketchup to use. If uh, ladies, if you're on a date and well, that's not a good example, let's say you go to a restaurant and uh, you want some ketchup and they bring you a bottle of Hunt's. Well, you should get up and leave because they're telling you that they don't care about you. If they did, they would put some Heinz on the table. I want to point that out. So their overall objective, of course, is to build profitable customer relationships. That would be everyone's overall objective. You don't want to build a non customer relationship or you don't want to have a prof profitable exchange uh, relationship where your customers hate you. And then by developing food superior in quality, taste, nutrition, and convenience that embrace its nutrition and wellness mission. All right. So that's just a, uh, an example of a company-wide strategic planning cut sheet that they might send out and say, the thing we're going to do over the next five years is going to be uh, fulfilling this mission. If you can't fit it into here, then into these objectives, then let's not do it. So we've talked about Heinz and we're talking about firms on a bigger level and typically 
larger companies will divide up their businesses into what are called SBUs or strategic business units. That could be a division of a company. Let's say uh, uh, I'll stay in the carpet business. I don't really know that much about it. I mean, I know a little bit about it, but let's say you have a division that sells flooring for RVs and you have a division that sells flooring for uh, apartments, right? They might have them divided up that way. Or product line within a division, let's say you have in the, in the carpet line, you have some kind of high-end carpet and then some kind of uh, outdoor carpet and you have something else. You might divide it up that way. Or you might just, something might be so big that you, um, that you just, a single product or a brand might be a product line. You know, Coca-Cola, the actual drink might be big enough to have its, have its own line. So this chart shows you 11 companies that just about control most everything you buy. Or it would, you could do life if, if you only shop with these 11 companies. So you can see, let me get a pointer here. <clears throat> Excuse me. You can see that, uh, let's go down here to Nestle. Now Nestle is a big, a big outfit, right? So you can see that Wonka is the separated by itself. And then under Wonka, you have uh, Sweet Tarts, Nerds, Gobstoppers, and, and all that. Uh, L'Oreal, L'Oreal, you can see you take this line down there to just perfumes. So that might be a product line or the way they separate. Because you don't want, I mean, does it make good sense to have the people that are working in the uh, Giorgio Armani perfume category, also making decisions about fancy feast cat food? Or maybe we have, should have some people who know about cat food because we're not selling these two items in the same place generally. We will sell, sell Alpo at a grocery store or Walmart or Target, I guess. And you might sell some of this at Target. But it's obviously different. The way you go to market would be different. And you can see that companies branch way out, way far out from where you, when you think of Nestle, most people think of chocolate, right? But, you know, they don't think about Hot Pockets. Uh, and sometimes they don't want you to line up the, the parent company with one of their product lines because it doesn't make sense, you know. Clorox doesn't want you to, you know, confuse Clorox with, uh, you know, a Twix candy bar because those just, you know, those just don't go together. Like you say, ah, I don't want that. Clorox is making that. So I'm going to come back to an item uh, on here in just a minute. But that chart kind of shows uh, how a company uh might separate their uh, SBUs. You can see how big it can get uh, depending on the company uh, that you're looking at. Um, so you would identify how you wanted to break them down and what they were, uh, assess the attractiveness of the different components of it, which, you know, profit and loss, uh, you know, the profit margin per unit, uh, expenses of making it and distributing it, whatever your assessment is, what you decide to assess it on. And then, of course, you would decide how much to support each one. You know, maybe we should not support this one as much as we have been because it seems to be doing fine without that much support. Or maybe we can support it because we're really not making that much money on it. Or whatever the whatever the decision rule uh, led you to. So there's a tool that has been used uh, since they developed it in Boston called a growth share matrix, right? Where you, it helps you to fit uh, different 
components of your firm into different quadrants on a box uh, and see, you know, helps you, gives you a, a way to look at them to make further decisions. The Boston Consulting Group growth share matrix uh, was developed by, guess who? The Boston, Boston Consulting Group. And uh, it's been, everybody uses it. You should know what it is. If somebody says, yeah, we need to do a BG on that, then this is what they're talking about. So let's say that you would, um, if you were Nestle or one of those other companies on the previous slide, and the boss said, look, fit everything in these four boxes, right? If it has a high growth rate, right, and a high market share, that's a star. Can you think of anything that might fit in there that you know just from being out in the world? So when the iPhone came out, it was certainly in that category. Um, and it may still be. It, it's way more than computers and things. So high market share, high market growth, star. High market share, but low market growth. Okay, it's the dog, it's the big dog in the business for that type of product, good. But it's got a low growth rate. Not a lot, of, it's not, not a lot of new people are buying it, but a ton of people still buy it. <clears throat> it's called a cash cow. It's throwing off money and you might not have to do much with it. Low market share, low growth rate, they call a dog and that's not right because dogs are excellent. I should have called it a cat. I'm just kidding if you're a cat person. Could have called it a armadillo or something, something nobody likes. But so uh, low market share, low market growth rate, a dog. And of course, what might we want to do with that? We might want to try to sell that off and just get rid of that. We might want to just, or just quit making it, don't sell it off, divest it. We may want to not put any money into it, let people that buy it continue buying it or whatever strategy we decide upon. And then a question mark has a low market share, but a high growth rate. So let's say, you know, we're selling 20% more every quarter. And for us, whatever our business is, that's high, but it's still a low market share. In other words, if it's a car and, uh, you know, we went from 500 units one year to a thousand the next year, well, that's a big improvement, a big increase. But of all the millions of cars that are sold, it's got a relatively low market share. So they categorize that as a question mark for further study. Can we help it get bigger faster? Or is that it? Or is it something on our end? We can't make a club of them or whatever. So this is a tool that has, uh, it's popular in business and it's taught in every quality business program. Uh, in the country and internationally, I'm sure. And that's how it operates, the BCG, uh, Boston Consulting Group, growth matrix. So here's an example, but don't pay attention to the quadrants because you see they're kind of flipped around. Whereas, uh, you know, dog was down here. Now it's a question mark. So in this example, cash cow, let's start with star like I did last time and there are different places. So high market growth, high market share, I've got Lipton and Dove, two brands everybody's familiar with. Cash cow, which is high market share, low market growth. Okay, it's a big dog, Hellman's is a big dog in the mayonnaise business. But, you know, it doesn't grow there's not tons of people getting turned on to mayonnaise. It's been around for, you know, millennia. Well, not millennia, but it's been around a long time. And uh, same with that Marmite spread, which is an international thing. We've got the dogs down there as Ragu and Slim Fast. So low market growth, low market share. 
Slim Fast was much bigger 20 ago. It was the one of the original diet. Supposed to taste like a milkshake or a yoo or something, but they taste terrible. And then ragu, right? It you know, spaghetti sauce, pasta sauces, that kind of stuff. Low market growth, low market share. And then we've got in this chart, they call it a problem child, same as a question mark, which is high growth but low share. T2 and OMO, which are international brands. I don't even believe they sell in the US. So if I asked you just to think about it for a second, you can pause the video if you want to. What company is this? It's one company that makes, that handles all these brands. And I'm telling you right now, if you're at home, if you went into your bathroom and picked up three random things in your bathroom, one of them will be made by this company. And they also make Hellman's mayonnaise. Unilever is the name of the firm. All right. They're the dog and they're the big dog in uh, all this stuff. You see Q-tips, Vaseline, we'll call them health and beauty aids, Pepsi Dent, Close Up, Dove, Axe, uh, which I smell in the hallways from time to time. Uh, if you go into, uh, like I say, about any bathroom, you're going to have Unilever products. You turn the bottle around and look at it. Do you notice any brand in there that you thought was a standalone brand? But turns out it's part of a large international conglomerate. Just look through them real quick. It'll be one you'll recognize. And somebody just recognized it, I'm sure. Look right here. Ben and Jerry's. Now, you ask most people about Ben and Jerry's, they'll say, oh, it's owned by those two, you know, those two uh, hippie guys up in Vermont. And, you know, they make it in a churn and carry it out to the stores and blah, blah, blah. Well, they're owned by Unilever, right? The same people that make Snickers. No, excuse me, I got that wrong. Not Snickers. But the same people that make, uh, you know, Pepsi Dent and Q-Tips. Now, they do retain uh, quite a bit more control over Ben and Jerry's than these other companies do. But, you know, they're made by the same company that makes a Klondike bar. And I bet you could, most people would say, well, you know, Klondike, that's a, you know, that's a mass produced uh, ice cream good. But Ben and Jerry's, they make them, they make them small batch by hand. Well, guess what? Not for a few years, they don't. <laughs> because the money was too good and they sold to Unilever. This is a picture of a grocery store shelf after Hurricane Harvey in Texas in 2017 that I found humorous when I saw it one day. Now you can see the shelves are emptied all around except for the a certain brand of Tostitos dip and some Lay's potato chips, right? So chicken and waffle, this might be a good way. You don't even need to do a BCG marketing matrix for Lay's. Lay's could have gone after a hurricane and said, okay, people were buying everything they could find, right? They were just loading up. But nobody, even during a hurricane, wanted our chicken and waffle flavor potato chips. We might need to drop that. It doesn't appear to be that good. All right. So um, what are the problems uh, with, the mar with the matrix? You might have difficulty in defining the SVUs, you know, grouping them together. Or measuring the market share and growth. You can't do that. You can't fit it into the into a quadrant. It can be time consuming, expensive, and most importantly, I think, you're focusing on your current businesses, not 
what product or what good or service we could offer in the future and how might it fit in the BCG matrix. We're just dividing up the ones we have. So it could be a time consuming process and you're just examining uh, your existing business. Now, suppose that uh, Lay's chicken and waffle flavored potato chips was a standalone uh, business. It's not Lay's as a part, you know, it has a bunch of different flavors. But let's say that it was. So here's another vocabulary term of downsizing. When you, when a company either has to prune something out, costs them too much money, they can't afford to keep doing it. Harvest it, right? Uh, just don't put any money into it and let it generate whatever it's going to generate. And just take the money out of it. Sell it. Because maybe it doesn't fit into what we're doing anymore. Maybe we used to be in, you know, cleaning supplies and food, but you know, we never could make food work. So maybe we need just to uh, sell the divest ourselves and concentrate in, in cleaning supplies. So uh, that's downsizing. And that is the end of part one of chapter two. I decided to divide it up into two because one might be too long, I thought. And uh, we will pick up with um, value chain. Isn't that exciting? For part two and some additional things. So that's the end of chapter two, part one. And I'll see you.